From 2007 to 8, Putin came to believe that the West was in decline, degenerate, and weak. It's at that moment he pronounced a more assertive Russia and started to act accordingly on the world stage and in relations to neighboring countries with the invasion of Georgia in 2008 and Crimea in 2014. NATO provocation is one excuse given for Russian aggression and is prominent in domestic Russian propaganda, but it's unlikely he saw NATO as a threat and must have known that they had neither the intent nor the capability to directly threaten Russian territory. After all, why would they when Europe's economy depended on Russian gas and oil? Rather, he may have seen NATO as an irritating barrier to his new imperial ambitions to unite the Russian-speaking world and former colonial territories. Welcome to the Silicon Curtain podcast. Please like and subscribe if you like the content we produce. It will really help to increase the popularity of our content in YouTube's algorithm and help new people to discover our amazing guests. Dr. Fiona Hill is a British American foreign affairs specialist and author. She is a former official at the US National Security Council, specializing in Russian and European affairs, and was a witness in the November 2019 House hearings during the first impeachment of Donald Trump. She earned a PhD in history from Harvard University in 1998. She currently serves as senior fellow at the Brookings Institution in Washington and will take up office as Chancellor of Durham University in England in summer of this year. She recently served as Deputy Assistant to the President and Senior Director for European and Russian Affairs on the National Security Council from 2017 to 2019. From 2006 to 2009, she served as National Intelligence Officer for Russia and Eurasia at the National Intelligence Council. She is author of There Is Nothing For You Here, Finding Opportunity in the 21st Century, and co-author of Mr. Putin, Operative in the Kremlin, Brookings Institutional Press, 2015. Hill has researched and published extensively on issues related to Russia, the Caucasus, Central Asia, regional conflicts, energy, and strategic issues. So Dr. Hill Fiona, it's a huge pleasure to have you on the channel. And we're going to jump straight into the questions. And um, I've watched, uh, obviously, a lot of your interviews. I'm going to try and ask some questions, which hopefully are a little bit different. Um, and let's start with Putin, because I know you have studied him over the years. You've been closer to events and his thinking than perhaps anyone else in the world in, in some ways. Um, do you get a sense that what we're seeing playing out here has something to do with Putin's sense of his own manifest destiny. It's almost sort of Shakespearean in some ways, in that the person of Putin and the state and the fate of the Russian state seem to have merged in his own mind. I think that's absolutely right, Jonathan. And, you know, it's something that's, you know, very troubling to observe. Um, you know, in some respects, there's been an evolution and a hardening of Putin in that context as well. I mean, he certainly had views when he came in, as everybody does. There was a particular context in which he'd grown up in the uh, post-World War II Soviet period, kind of the peak in many respects of, uh, of Soviet power, joining the KGB in the 1970s at a time when one would have, uh, you know, based on all kinds of different indices, have thought that the, the Soviet Union was performing pretty well. But it's really the kind of the height of the Cold War, and that definitely shapes his, his viewpoints. And he also um, has been very much uh, shaped not just by his interpretations and his um, own lessons that he's taken from Russian history as it was taught in um, the Soviet educational system, but also from his own experience of the Soviet Union. It's very hard for Putin to think of Ukraine and any other uh, former Soviet Republic as not being part of Russia and the kind of the, the map, the geographic map of his own mind. He certainly thinks of uh, Russia as including Ukraine and Belarus in that kind of larger uh, prospect, perhaps not all of Central Asia and maybe the Caucasus, but it's certainly in his mental map of what it meant to him as somebody who thought himself as a Russian in a Soviet context, going to uh, Ukraine, Crimea, traveling through Belarus, you know, for example, that Slavic world, a largely Russian speaking world. And as we've seen over the last several years, particularly since he returned to the presidency, 
having been prime minister, his gaze has become more and more focused and fixated on Ukraine. And when I say the hardening of these views, I actually think that COVID had a lot to do with this. A lot of other people are talking about this as well, but you know, Vladimir Putin spent a good period of COVID like all of us did and uh, under kind of um, house confinement. His house is a bit different from most of ours. I spent a lot of time in this little box that you can kind of see, you know, here, which is a kind of a small office on the edge of my house. Uh, he had um, offices in the Kremlin, at various statues out in, uh, you know, Valdai and uh, down on the Black Sea. But nonetheless, he was left in many respects to his own devices. The, the circle around him shrank. And he became much more focused on his view of the world and on his legacy. And I think that's kind of, you know, what you're really asking about here. And the nature of the Russian system has become such that over the last 23 years, he's been with us for 23 years now, that vertical of power has really uh, become sharper and sharper, more uh, of a vertical, more of a kind of a very tight cohort of people around him, more into groupthink and more into um, really focusing on that view that for him, you know, now in this phase, bringing these territories back into Russia's orbit is the imperative. And, and that's the other thing we suspect. Along the line, he decided to move on into Ukraine and just to take it back by force if he couldn't get it through negotiation. Because in the period where, and I know um, you have, uh, you know, not just started from afar, I know you, you've actually been um, in the same room as him and got to observe at close quarters um, how that machinery around him uh, works. Um, but it does seem to be a very different Putin now than the one perhaps we saw uh, prior to 2007 in the Munich speech. Um, and over the years, he seems to have gained a, a penchant for history or mythologized history, I think, uh, as opposed to objective history. But he's moved from being perhaps a chancer um, as you've described very eloquently in your book, as sort of more of an operative, someone looking for sort of opportunities to push uh, Russian interests forward to perhaps being more ideologically driven. Yes, I mean, if we can describe it as an ideology, it's, but certainly it's a worldview, right, driven by a specific worldview. Um, you know, I'm not sure if everything kind of really hangs together with you know any coherence uh, you know, to make it more of an ideology, although it's, you know, very much one rooted in, you know, kind of historic Russian cultural patterns of a very centralized uh, government and, you know, with one person really at the, at the heart of all of this. And then, you know, picking up on all kinds of perspectives of Russian values that overlap with, you know, a lot of the so-called culture wars that we see, you know, kind of elsewhere in, in, in the West and in Europe, and especially, you know, here in the United States. And it's kind of a mishmash of things, a kind of a, a synthesis of all kinds of uh, different viewpoints. There's a, you know, very heavy emphasis on uh, the old Russian empire and the kind of heartland of, heart of the imperial culture and that Russian imperial heartland with a kind of a smattering then of kind of Soviet uh, viewpoints in there as well. But it's certainly one in which he is at the very center of it all. And as you saying, this kind of mythologizing and this redefining of, uh, of Russian history. And if you go back to the campaign book that was put together when he first becomes president in, in the first person at Pierre Valitso, you do see um, some references there to his interest in history. Uh, the, one of the classes that he was, you know, kind of good at in school. And in 2011, I was at one of those Valdai discussion uh, clubs that um, the Kremlin uh, has put together. It was actually the last one uh, that I attended as well. Uh, and there was a big emphasis on Putin's interest in history uh, being made by uh, Dmitry Peskov, uh, the press spokesman. And ever since that period, so for the last 10, 11, coming on 12 years, Putin has become what Clifford Gaddy and I described in our book, Mr. Putin Operative in the Kremlin, the history man. And I would never have really kind of thought when we were putting that book together, that would become the most defining feature of Putin, that he becomes the Russian history man. It's how he defines history and the people around him define history that um, is meant to put the stamp on everything. And, and it's that Orwellian sense of he who you know is controlling the past can also control the present and controlling that narrative of the, part, the past and also try to shape the future. And that's basically what Putin is trying to do right now, is trying to use his interpretations of the past to define the present and actually do, basically dictate what the future is going to be for Ukraine and in many respects the rest of Europe. He still thinks in terms of spheres of influence 
And, you know, many of the reactions that we get to the war in Ukraine, the kind of the blame that's kind of apportioned to the West and to Europe is for not accepting Russia's sphere of influence and, you know, the kind of imperial thinking of Russia and not accepting, you know, frankly, that Ukraine now for 30 years has been recognised as an independent state within certain territorial borders, including by Russia itself. You know, back after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and then, you know, at various points since then. And isn't a failure as well to really get inside, um, well, as you say, Putin's worldview, it harks back to a previous age, um, but also the value he places on on certain victories or certain assets is different, isn't it? It's, it's, it's land. It's a very 19th century, even 18th century view of what is a a valuable asset for the state to uh, to to obtain so it's it's territorial ambition whereas the world to an extent has moved on it's become more digital it's become more about ideas that's where the real sort of economic value lies so in a way we fail to really understand his worldview and what he places value on yeah look i think that is where we are to blame um you know it's because we fail to fully recognize just as you point out there the worldview and the perspective and where he and the people around him were coming from. Because so many Russians weren't coming from that vantage point either. I mean, all the people that everybody knows and interacted with, and we've all got Russian friends. And, you know, while some of them might have been, you know, somewhat interested in that history, they were really living real lives in the real world. And this is the tragedy and the catastrophe of all of this for Russia as well as for Ukraine and for all the rest of us, is that, you know, people like Putin and the people around Putin have pulled us all back into a different era and a different age. In many respects, it's not just the 20th century. And, you know, here we are again in another great power conflict, like Germany did, did twice over, World War One and World War Two. But we're also getting pulled back to the periods of the 19th century, thinking about the Crimean War of the 1850s, or even further back. I mean, Putin keeps dragging us back to earlier eras and kind of demands, you know, for Russia's primacy and dominance of a particular region. And, and we were kind of failing to address this. We didn't, we didn't, you know, kind of push back on it. We didn't try to counter it. Or we didn't try to think of other arrangements, you know, to kind of uh, bring Russia into a kind of a, a broader European uh, perspective and give them a stake. I mean, there were various different um, efforts made, but they weren't very consistent. And ultimately they didn't really kind of factor this in. You know, there the, the was a very them. strong group of people still thinking this way, and it goes back to the early 1990s. There's been a, re a declassification, actually, of a um, whole host of early documents um, pertaining to exchanges between Boris Yeltsin and George Herbert Walker Bush, the, the first uh, Bush, in the 1990s um, by the State Department. It's really interesting. I was reading some of this yesterday, going back to a lot of these exchanges initially after the collapse of the Soviet Union, and Yeltsin assuring Bush that he wasn't an imperialist and saying that there were still a lot of tensions in Russia and Ukraine because there were Ukrainian nationalists who really wanted to pull far away from Russia, just as there were Russian nationalists that wanted to pull Ukraine back again. And that those tensions were there, but they have Yegor Gaida, somebody who I knew very well, and you know, you and many others knew as well, that a deputy prime minister saying that there would never be a Yugoslav type uh, war um, between Russia and Ukraine. Well, 30 years on, there is. This is the wars of the Soviet succession. And it's taken 30 years to fully manifest itself, although one could argue it was, you know, 20 years with the annexation of, uh, of Crimea. Even Solovyov, if you've seen that extraordinary video of uh, Solovyov from about, I think it's 2012, um, essentially saying that a war with Ukraine is is inconceivable and it would be the worst crime in, in history if the Russian people were to do that. It's extraordinary what difference sort of 10, 10 years makes. Um, yeah, and then the thing is that the Russian people, it's, you know, Putin made this decision. You know, it's kind of he made the decision to do this. When people say, oh, Russia was provoked. No, Putin provoked himself. I mean, he got himself so worked up about this um, idea, clearly, and the people around him. Mm. And there was always a kind of a testing, you know, when I was in the government and we would meet with senior Russian officials, they'd say, what is Ukraine to you? We'd be like, well, what do you mean? What is it to us? You can you see this was a kind of our own misreading. I mean, you know, various different levels, I, of course, understood this, but we kept trying to say, look, we don't want Ukraine. <laughs> it's not our sphere of influence. We're not you know, trying to kind of carve the world up. But there was still a very strong perception in the group around Putin, which we never really try, could, could properly explain, um, you know, to them you know, how we were seeing things in a different light, because they kept still thinking that we also believed 
in geopolitics and spheres of influence because of course you know the united states invaded iraq the united states moved into afghanistan you know the united states would flex its muscle in other places as well but in terms of europe and europeans you know with the exception of turkey um moving into cyprus northern cyprus other european countries weren't going around you know basically annexing the territory of their neighbors i mean there was of course britain's fight with argentina over the falkland islands but Brit europe had got out of the business of sphere of influences but putin believes that the united states is still an occupying force in europe mm. he even restated that this week president. didn't he and he has he's mm. stated this and so we so we're kind of stuck in this you know clash of empires and a lot of the rest of the world believes this as well to be honest I mean, a lot of people who, you know, push back against this because of their view too, that the United States is still an occupying force in Europe and that, you know, Europe has no agency and other countries do not. And that, you know, NATO is a is some kind of entity completely co controlled by the United States that expands out. But we actually can see in real time, if people are looking properly at this, that, you know, the United States doesn't control everything in NATO. Turkey is blocking the entry of Sweden and Finland and could possibly continue to do that indefinitely. And the United States can do very little about it. It's just that we're, we're all kind of stuck in these old patterns of looking at things. And, you know, it's very hard to see otherwise. And honestly, I think for most of us, like you and I, who, you know, did start studying Russian and, you know, visiting uh, the Soviet Union, you know, back in the day and spent all of our time, as you have said as well, you know, at different points studying this, it's inconceivable also to be in this position. It's inconceivable to see Russia as an aggressor in this kind of way and an invader, you know, of territory that is kind of closely linked. It would be like, you know, but it was in the past, of course, England invading Scotland. Well, you know, at different points we did. <laughs> English yeah. did invade Scotland and also Ireland and Wales, you know. So Britain is still an empire, actually, just a mini one, a mini mm -hmm. version of, of its imperial self. And we've had uh, troubles in Northern Ireland and, you know, British troops, you know, kind of sent over there. But it seems to be inconceivable to think of things on this kind of scale. I think most Ukrainians, of course, have been or initially were in a state of shock, as, as Russians have been as well. Absolutely. And we're talking just before we, we hit the record button about the fact that this is this is viewed, it seems to be, certainly by the propagandists and, and, and by those who are pulling the strings in Russia as, you know, they're playing a zero sum game. Um, and the trouble is that, you know, when you're outside of that and you're not playing that game, You've got no answer to that simplistic way of looking at the world. The sort of win-lose scenario seems to be how they interpret the world. They also, and and you know, you 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 know this far better than I from studying Putin. Coming from that KGB operative background, he doesn't seem to have the belief uh, in organic social movements, organic political movements. Everything is some kind of technology or like or a color revolution. So right. he probably genuinely sees the CIA behind Maidan and the Orange Revolution. He probably does not believe that there's any such thing as an organic uh, civil society movement in Ukraine. No, that's true. And look, there's an awful lot of people who, you know, would say, absolutely, there's all this whataboutism. I mean, I find that many times when you're talking about all of this and, you know, you have various interlocutors who are kind of pushing back, it's often posited on their view of the United States and its behavior. And, you know, which is appalling and atrocious in many of these cases, the all like, like outlining here, the CIA interventions, taking people out, assassinations. But the United States has actually, you know, moved a lot further on from a lot of this, you know, some cases notwithstanding in the case of Soleimani in Iran, you know, for example. But we're in a different world. But absolutely, Putin continues to see what he always saw all the way along from the 1970s onwards, that the United States is the main uh, opponent and that the United States behaves in the same way. And this is a clash with the United States. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think, you know, at some level, although this really is all about Russia and Ukraine, it also is for Putin, as he said all the way along, for him, this kind of the final showdown on the bridge, you know, with the United States. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, kind of if, if Russia had been forced to pull out of, of Europe and it's uh, an Eastern Bloc, as the successor state to the Soviet Union in the 1990s, why did the US not and uh, pull out? So this is it, because of course, the nature of the transatlantic relationship evolved and changed as well. And of course, we keep seeing that the United States gets pulled back into Europe. You know, just against its, its will, to an extent. Against its will. I mean, that's, you know, the kind of thing that, you know, I get a lot of 
pushback from people who are not sitting here. There's a huge debate again going on in the United States, just like there was at the beginning of World War II. I mean, remember, the United States didn't have to help Britain in the early 1940s, and there was a lot of reluctance to step up and help the United Kingdom initially in the war, in the Second World War. And in the World War I, the United States didn't want to come in either. Mm. And there's always those tendencies of isolationism in the United States and pulling back. And there's this always an assumption that the only way to engage the United States is militar militarily. And we are all going to have to think about the future here, about the future of the relationship between the United States and Europe and, and other countries and the whole perspective of European security. But most Europeans, all of them uh, you know, included, whether you're in the EU or NATO or and are separate from those institutions saying, we don't want to be back in that 20th century period of conflict over territory and the, the ch forcible changes of borders. And that's why the... It's not getting articulated in a, in a clear way. And there are lots of countries in Europe, just to, you know, kind of just refine that point a little bit further, that, that are new. I mean, Germany's only reunified again, uh, you know, after 1870s and then being, you know, basically divided. Every, every European country, with just a handful of exceptions, has had an experience like Ukraine of having independence and then having to kind of like fight off uh, basically aggressors. And coming back to to the problem, I mean, it's very easy, isn't it? Uh, and especially, uh, as you know, you, you get millions of messages to see the world in these big geopolitical sort of abstract ideological points of view. But if we follow the logic that NATO was not a physical threat to Russia, that it genuinely would have known that NATO did not have the forces to, or the inclination to take any uh, Russian territory, then the crisis comes back to something far simpler. And again, back to the Shakespearean analogy, it's the lack of a succession mechanism in Russia. It's the fact that you've got an incredibly complex post-industrial power that has the political sophistication of a Viking fiefdom, basically. Um, and, and they don't seem to have moved beyond that level. In fact, the Soviet Union, far more sophisticated politically than the monocracy that uh, Putin has created. You've put that really well, Jonathan, and I, I think that's kind of something that seems to be missing in these you know, debates. You know, we have people getting labelled, you know, realists, neocons, you know, this is if there's kind of like, you know, one side, it's just a kind of an intellectual debate here. It really isn't. And it really does come down to the fact that Russia, unfortunately, over the last 23 years has evolved into a system where only one man counts. And it's gone back to kind of, the, as you're saying, the period of the czars, where we're now in a kind of succession crisis. Every single question is about what's in Vladimir Putin's head? What if, is he sick? Uh, does he have a succession? Who will succeed him? And how can we be in that position? I mean, this was, you know, in the 1990s, of course, you know, somewhat kind of chaotic, but a very sophisticated country. And it still is a sophisticated country with a lot of amazing people here, but the, the whole system is now crushing everyone. And there are real risks that we can see in our own systems of going down, you know, some of that path as well uh, by, you know, having the fetishization of uh, the presidency in the United States, for example, you know, something that I've been very concerned about from my vantage point here, you know, removing checks and balances in other systems because people find them frustrating or that, you know, kind of the, the constraints on things that they want to see move forward. I mean, what has Russia has been hollowed out in, in many respects over the last uh, 23 years and, you know, our own failure to recognize that and to, you know, to deal with it. That's, that's and, also been extremely difficult. And, you know, there the, the were other ways of us engaging, you know, with, with Russia that could have maybe emphasized, you know, different different pathways. In fact, if we go back to the 1990s, when Boris Yeltsin shelled the Russian White House, the, the Russian parliament at the time, we could have dealt with that differently. I mean, that was exactly the period where I you know, started studying Russians. So my first trip to Russia was in between 91 and the Gorbachev Putsch and 92. And, you know, that, that first trip to St. Petersburg, they actually had the the metal barriers, you know, piled up on the sides of the streets, almost like a, a Maidan movement um, years before Maidan. Um, so that sort of popular protest, you know, you can see that, that there are periods in Russia's history where the people have had a chance to express their voice. Um, but with the accession of Putin, um, 
it's an extraordinary moment, isn't it? Because it's a moment of chance. It's almost like an accident of Yeltsin's pen uh, conjuring into existence a kind of parochikije, a kind of nobody. And, and even Zelensky last week, as, a, as an insult, uh, referred to Putin as a nobody. He's, he's the accidental czar. Well, he's become very much a somebody, you know, over the last 23 years. In fact, you know, that book, The um, Accidentals, I've actually got this here. My uh, colleague next door from Brookings at Carnegie, and Andrew Weiss, has just, you know, created, um, I, I think you should be referencing to this, uh, a graphic version. Of, I've interviewed of him about that. Yeah, yeah exactly. Yeah, excellent it's, interview. Uh, it's, a, <laughs> it's a fascinating, you know, kind of way of depicting, you know, what's happened. And you know, uh, there was a debate about this just in the last couple of days that I was chairing and people saying, so how do you, you know, square all these contradictions? You're kind of saying that he was, and as Zelensky saying he's a nobody, but he's absolutely a somebody now. He is the somebody, the somebody who decides everything, including life or death, literally, and invading another country and creating this enormous tragedy. How do you square all of this? And it's, you know, partly the nature of the system. And, you know, it's something that should be a real cautionary tale for all of us. And I think we are going to have to start to think about, look, what lessons can we take away from everything, you know, that we've been thinking about over the last, you know, 30 plus years of, uh, you know, kind of a, a standalone independent Russia? Was it a great idea to make Russia the successor state to the Soviet Union? You know, how did we, you know, continue then to think about everything? Everything was initially done through the lens of Moscow. And, you know, with other um, empires, you know, when the Austro-Hungarian Empire came apart, there was Hungary and there was Austria. <laughs> we didn't, you know, kind of, you know, basically look at everything through Vienna, you know, completely. And, it, we, and I think this has been, you know, part of the issue, and we've all been guilty of it, former Soviet Union, the near abroad, the Commonwealth of Independent States. I mean, these were all kind of mechanisms, you know, that were created. It, would, it, 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 it gets to the kind of question about, is it still, you know, valid to look at, India, Pakistan, and Canada, and New Zealand, and Australia through the lens of London. That's it. And, and we've moved on these are kind of uh, overseas, yes. I mean, and, and still, you know, you've got the, the tensions in Britain between Scotland and, and England, because Scotland was an independent state completely until 1707, and still has you know, its own independent perspective within the United Kingdom. And in Wales and, you know, an island, uh, the Republic of Ireland and Northern Ireland. I mean, we deal with this every single day in different contexts, but our own mental maps of, you know, Russia, Ukraine, Belarus, all kind of still puts everything in Russia's orbit as well. Having lived in Scotland, and we both have, I mean, we don't, or rather the English side of the country doesn't necessarily deal with it in the most sensitive and, uh, and best no. manner either. Um, Not at all. And there's lots uh, of, you know, regional differentiation coming from the northeast of England. I mean, there's a sort of a separate history there, too. And I think, you know, when you when you go around to different parts of Europe, people, you know, really have internalized this and understand it. I mean, it's just when you put the US in the mix and think that this is a, a tussle between, you know, the United States and Russia and that, you know, where to blame, you know, for all of this as well. I mean, yeah, we've been inconsistent in the way that we've looked at things. We haven't been very good at articulating anything. We haven't fully understood you know, what we were dealing with, that we were living in different time um, frames, not just, you know, different outlooks on the world. Putin's living in a different time sequence to the rest of us. And we're kind of, we've him. kind of moved on in different ways, and parts of Russia had moved on. I mean, Moscow is that, you know, incredibly complex locus of all of the most progressive in the kind of technological, you know, social, scientific, cultural sense of everything that was happening in Russia. And at the same time, you know, kind of the, the sort of deeper history going back to the medieval era. And we ascribe to him far more, perhaps, strategic skill and foresight than he actually possesses. I mean, it may well turn out when when history, you know, um, roots through the sort of dustbin of, of this period. Um, that, that actually, you know, his decisions were made not on some grand strategic plan or extraordinary information, but were based on a sort of opportunistic uh, sort of hunch, which has gone horribly wrong. And, and that local factors and, uh, you know, local, more individual thinking uh, is, is, is far more important than these geopolitical factors. Yeah, I think he had these larger strategic goals. I mean, literally, if making Russia great again as a great power. He certainly had the idea of the kind of imperial thinking of Russia, you know, being a modern version of the, the empire, having dominance in this region again, still seeing the United States as the main adversary, the main imperial, you know, uh, 
opponent here. But I also had a, you know, as you said, there was kind of saw an opportunity uh, to act on this. He completely misread Ukraine and Ukrainians and Zelensky and everybody else as well and didn't realize how people would react. He assumed that there would be an immediate capitulation of Ukraine and that there would be an immediate, you know, dash as there had been in 2014 to try to kind of resolve things and come up with some kind of peace process, which would have put Ukraine back into, you know, Russia's orbit as a dependency, a dependency. And I mean, that hasn't happened. I mean, I think what he was gunning for, literally, was a, a new union of a Slavic union with Russia, Belarus and Ukraine and possibly Kazakhstan and northern Kazakhstan. The Kazakhs worry about that. And then his own chosen presidents of each of these, maybe even of Russia, mm. you know, so you devolve down to and him being the, you know, the kind of the leader of that new union. So Transnistria and, and you know, fermenting yeah, further I mean, who, upsets who, on the border. Yeah, I mean, who who kind of knows that? But it's really that kind of drive that we've we've seen in you know, some circles in Russia since the early 1990s to kind of bring everything back together again. And then if you go back to these documents, Yeltsin saying, I would never do this. I'm not an imperialist. But then we remember in 1992, Andrei Kozarev, the foreign minister of Russia at the time made a speech at the Organization Security and Cooperation um, Movement uh, meeting in Stockholm in Sweden. And he says, he lays out this kind of neo-imperial view of, you know, back in the USSR, bring all the everything back together again. And then later he says, well, that's the hardline speech. They're all back. And those are the people who, you know, stand behind Putin now. Yeltsin was of a different persuasion. Also, I mean, being realistic, he knew that Russia didn't have the wherewithal at that point. But when Putin starts to be more assertive, you know, beginning in 2007 onwards, you know, Russia starts to have the wherewithal. And I think, you know, getting back to your point about opportunism, he thought in 2022 that this was the moment. Chancellor Merkel's gone. The United States has this shambolic, uh, awful withdrawal from Afghanistan that was on the cards in the previous administration, but this administration did it. Britain's divided. Yeah. Britain's divided, having fights with France. And he's, you know, basically also, you know, constantly been asking us, what do you, what, what's Ukraine to you? We've had, you know, Donald Trump trying to force uh, Volodymyr Zelensky into doing things for him. It's clear we don't care about Ukraine. I think Boris Johnson's just been saying, you know, recently we'd offer Ukraine much, but being prepared to give it little. And that was kind of as far as Putin was concerned, the time was the most propitious it was ever going to be no. if you want to basically take this back. So off he went. And in truth, if he had rolled over and taken Kiev in, in two weeks, then we wouldn't have done anything about it. It would have been another case of, uh, you know, we would have cried into our hankies about it like uh, Czechoslovakia in 68, et cetera. But we would have done nothing We would have set it. up some, you know, kind of new... Um, but that's what he was banking on, new institutional arrangement. We'd have put on sanctions, yeah. as we have. And, you know, I mean, Russia's always got ways of adapting to sanctions like we've seen now year out. And then, and, and that's basically what Putin is saying, look, you can still end this war, you, you know, the kind of the West and Ukraine. You can just give it up. Mm. You can accept the new realities. And he says, you know, you have to accept that Russia is expanding its borders. And, you know, if you don't, there'll be nuclear Armageddon, there'll be all these various different things, but, you know, kind of, we can stop this now. And then, you know, we could have had, we can have now, um, you know, what you could have had at the beginning, but without all this carnage and bloodshed. That's kind of basically what the offer that he's giving to everybody. It's a and of course, you know, for any of us, you know, anybody who's worried about, you know, more people dying, you know, get emails, you know, from people all the time, how can you be basically having this, you know, kind of perspective on, you know, the war while people are dying? You know, we should just stop it now. But I think, you know, what the Ukrainians and others have internalized is that it wouldn't stop. I mean, the bloodshed, you know, might, but the pressure would not stop. And the opportunity to kind of take more. So he takes Donbass, Zaporizhia and Kherson. Then what? I mean, he still wants to take Kiev. No, it'd if be like it. Be... Stop, there wouldn't be any further, um, no. you know, basically offensives. How would it be like Chechnya? I mean, if there was a frozen war... He'd come back in five years' time if he's still around, or his successor well, that's what, would. That's what happened. I was actually involved, you know, as a much younger person with the negotiations for Hasavut Accord back in 1997. There was a whole group of people, that, um, you know, were working with the Russian government on this, and I was one of the, you know, the junior people in this whole endeavor. And there was an agreement with Chechnya. And less than a year later, 
it was completely overturned and Russia was right back at it again. Yeah, that's right. And, and then, you know, you, can, you know, look at all of the other efforts, you know, where there have been, you know, interventions diplomatically and otherwise. I still do believe that diplomacy is crucial and constraining this. I mean, I'm, I mean, how can anybody be, you know, supportive of this mass carnage? But there's sometimes, as you know, one Ukrainian uh, said to me, sometimes a war has to be fought whether you like it or not. Mm. And many of the Finns have told the Ukrainians, look, you know, we had to fight. In 1941, we didn't want to in the Winter War. Mm. And it's the only way you get their attention, which is, you know, a terrible thing to, you know, have to basically say here. And that works, you know, pushing back the force that the Finns applied, um, it actually worked and brought Stalin to the negotiating table. Yeah, I mean, they actually lost, of course. I mean, they lost all of Karelia and, you know, huge swathes of territory around St. Petersburg, but they also won. Mm. I mean, they won their independence. And that's, you know, why Finland wants to join NATO now. Is because they see that the calculation has changed and they were okay with being independent and non-aligned but you know taking care of their own security not being demilitarized and not being you know neutral in that sense of neutered uh but now they feel that russia's rapacious again and who's got the longest border with russia finland you know after you think about you know ukraine and you know belarus and so i mean their, their strategic and security calculations have changed completely and the nuclear saber rattling, Finland and Sweden will completely oppose nuclear weapons. And now they see that what Putin is doing necessitates being within the strategic nuclear umbrella of NATO. I mean, the whole thing is on its head. Mm. And it's, you know, I think it, it, it's something that all of us are now going to have to kind of grapple with about, I mean, I certainly don't feel, you know, any, um, satisfaction at all in looking at where these things have have moved and, and and what we're having to do i feel just the weight of this terrible tragedy you know it's, did it's it really have to be like this is this what we thought it would be like i mean when i was you know studying the soviet union in the late 1980s when things were opening up or working there in the 1990s and going backwards and forwards and you know doing my phd research did i think this is where we end up i was worried that we might be end up in this way i wrote a report when i was at the kennedy school in uh, late 1993 called Back in the USSR, really worrying after the, uh, the Kozarev speech. I was working with a group of Russians who were also really worried that this was a tendency. And then, you know, we kind of became complacent after because it didn't happen in the early 1990s. And there was Chechnya and that was kind of a, it seemed that that carnage got people's attention. And just like, you know, Gaidar and Yeltsin and others, so they couldn't conceive of this conflict. And people were shocked by what happened in Transnistria, for example, in Nagorno Karabakh. But here we are. You know, I mean, it's basically 20 years on, there's the taking of Crimea, and then here we are in a full-blown war, another great power conflict on the European landmass, you know, for the third time in the century, over the same things, disputes about what board, where borders belong, where, you know, Europe was trying to move to a borderless, you know, trade, you know, mobility, emphasising institutional arrangement. It's about more, though, isn't it? It's about Ukraine, which has provided a template out of the post-Soviet mire of corruption and nepotism. And uh, I know you're pushed for time, and it's probably a topic we'll have to explore uh, on another occasion. Um, corruption, nepotism is sort of sort of empty. You know, it's a, a deep barrel of conversation there. Um, but it makes me wonder whether we're also making the same mistake in that we're focusing on Navalny. We're focusing on um, his team and certain liberal figures. We're pinning our hopes on individuals, whereas what we should be focusing on is institution building, because Ukraine has yeah. shown that that is their way out of the post-Soviet yeah. moment. And they've got to do a lot of cleaning up, as we know. I mean, Ukraine had a terrible reputation for corruption, and rightly so. Uh, and that's still a big question, is whether Ukraine can rein that in. And we see you know, now in this last few weeks, uh, Zelensky and people around him actually trying to do something to root out the corruption that inevitably emerges during wartime. I mean, if you look back to World War II in the United Kingdom, there was plenty of people, you know, black market and profiteering and all kinds of discussions going on the same way when, you know, this is this is sadly a very, you know, pertinent fact that uh, of life and reality during you know kind of wartime that somebody's going to make money out of it just like they do in, in in peacetime and we've got to address that for the future and certainly in reconstruction of ukraine people won't want to see that money uh, wasted but the template of ukraine finding a way out into a different path this is where 
NATO, the European Union and everything else come in, associations with the United States, anything else. Russia didn't want Ukraine to have any kind of alternative. And when it talked about neutralization of Ukraine, it meant, you know, Ukraine that had nowhere to go other than still dependency on Russia. And, you know, even that's touting Austria and, you know, other kind of countries and neutrality, Switzerland, you know, wherever. The whole idea was that this wouldn't be a kind of a country that would be asserting itself in any kind of major way. And a lot of Ukrainians going back to the early 1990s had different ideas. And it wasn't about language and other identity, although there were, you know, obviously lots of Ukrainian nationalists who wanted to have that expression. You know, as we know, in many settings in Europe, language isn't the only bearer of identity, including in Scotland, for example, where the vast majority of people speak English. Well, you know, Scots variants of English, but, you know, English nonetheless. Same in the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, all these identities are, are not driven by language, but of a sense of wanting something different, of a different, you know, kind of civic or political uh configuration and that's that's where ukraine is and that's exactly right ukraine was showing a template for going in a different direction just like finland has done and poland has done from uh having uh, freed themselves from the russian empire earlier or the baltic states which of course were back in the soviet union as well and got their independence too in 1991 having you know first been independent after the dissolution of the russian empire it's it's just incredibly complex and very difficult and you know, there's, there's sort of too much sort of simplification of this issue. I mean, we, we really are in an enormous catastrophe and tragedy at this particular juncture. Mm. But it won't be solved by, you know, kind of simply, you know, writing off large swathes of Ukrainian territory and not really addressing, you know, the kind of problems that have emerged in Russia. This is not the Russia in 2023 of 1993 or 2003 or 2013. You know, this is a Russia that has evolved under Putin into something you know, much darker and, you know, grimmer in all kinds of respects than we would have envisaged before. And if we push that can down the road, it's potentially going to be even more horrific to try and solve that problem in five years time, eight, 10 years time. Um, that's the, that's the problem of it all. But, you know, again, I mean, we should never forget just the scale of uh, the suffering and tragedy and the deaths here. And I mean, I don't think anybody takes any comfort i mean some people spout off about this but they shouldn't you know about the idea of you know russian casualties and you know teaching the russians a lesson because look that's the way putin's thinking about how to teach ukrainians a lesson and everybody else and we can't go down that pathway um, and again you has got to remember and keep channeling that horror and revulsion of world war one and world war two we said never again but we also know that you know just kind of handing over ukraine to russia that's not never again yeah that's just also perpetuating the problems and that's why the poles and the bolts and the Finns and others are reacting to this as well well i know your uh push for time and i've actually had more of your time than i expected uh which is a, a huge privilege um i think we got through about 25 percent of the questions so oh good yeah I maybe might... we're using this again yeah yes yeah. I might suggest a, a, a sequel, which a very cheeky uh, suggestion there. But it has been a huge pleasure to to get your insights uh, into the situation. And I do recommend people check out your books. We'll put links in the description uh, of the video and the incredible interviews, of course, they can find on YouTube, uh, which you feature in. Thank you so much, Jonathan. It's really nice to talk to you. And I'm, I'm really glad we got this opportunity. Uh, it's a huge pleasure, Dr. Hill. Thank you so much. Thanks.